Hello, and welcome to another Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with Arizona AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. And during another month of national caregiving, we will be reaching out to caregivers who find themselves in challenging positions of being a caregiver to offer you resources. And you can also find these resources on our website by visiting us at aarp.org backslash caregiving. Enjoy your tour. Be safe and be well. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome on December 9th. Have we got a great show for you this evening? So I want to welcome all of you that are watching. I know some are watching on YouTube. We have a couple of people probably watching on Twitch as well as Facebook, where most of you are watching. So thank you so much for being here as we get ready for a really fun show. Now, we always like I always like to do today is what? So today, back in 1924, Wapataki National Monument was established by President Calvin Coolidge. Now, this is to date almost 36,000 acres. So it's quite a large place. It represents a cultural crossroad, home to numerous groups of people over thousands of years, and an understanding of people and multiple perspectives, and including even today, those the architecture, as well as it's famous for a blowhole, that when it's warm outside, it blows cold air on you, which is always so much fun. Now, today is also National Pastry Day, so it's a great way to get carbs delivered right into your mouth on so many tasty bakeries around town through so many cultures. Um, I think one of the earliest pastries they've been able to distinguish is baklava. So, oh my gosh, I wish I had some baklava right now. Also, it is National Llama Day. Those cute fuzzy creatures not just give their fur or wool for communities across the planet, but also wind up being haulers and things. There's actually up in Prescott, there is a group called the Arizona Backcountry Llamas, and you can go backpacking with a llama toting your gear. How much fun is that? Now, it is also National Techno Day for the... Z -Z -Z I'm sure I'm not doing it justice, um, but that is because of Juan Atkins, who was born on this date back in 1962, who was just outside of Detroit and is said to be one of the, that is the birthplace, and he was the grandfather of techno music. So what can you expect today? Well, you know, we always have a little bit of Arizona music history. We have Little Arizona. We have From the Vault. We've, of course, got some trivia, a cocktail, and a special guest. So we've got a lot of fun going on tonight. Now, you might be wondering, if this is your first time here, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore. I got here about 22 years ago. Um, I was working and living in Brooklyn at the time and des decided to trade this beautiful Carnegie building for a little 1950s library in South Phoenix, which is now home, housed in a quite more modern building. Still in that same neck of the woods, 7th Avenue and Buckeye. Now, as soon as we got here, we promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch that is pretty much a time capsule. You can see there's my kitchen as it sits today. All that buttercream yellow tile, the yellow in the mall kitchen. 
oven with no window. So as I'm baking things for this holiday season, I've got to be extra careful when I shut that door because nobody wants a fallen cake. Now, as soon as I got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history here. But, you know, I knew that wasn't true. There was all that post-war history. All those folks had been moving here after the war, either looking for a new way of life after traveling through here on the way to somewhere else where they were stationed, being trained here, or actually even being stationed here. And they were, they moved here looking for new ways of life and just changed Arizona forever. Now I'm also called the hip historian, which means I get to have a lot of fun with Arizona history, just like what we're doing right now. Now, on December 18th, in a couple of weeks, we actually have a Haunted Phoenix tour where we get to walk around downtown about two hours, two miles of talking about buildings and things that happened in them. We also have this coming weekend, our monthly LGBT storytelling circle. So that will be lots of fun. If you know anybody who would like to sign up for that, they can go check out Facebook on AZ Gay History. Also, this coming Saturday, December 11th, is Psycho Day, because that's when the movie was shown. It comes across as saying, hey, Phoenix, Arizona, December 11th, 1960. Also, Festive is coming up in about, actually, next week. We're actually going to be down there. We'll talk a little bit about what's going on with Festivus in just a little bit as well. Now, I see some of you have found the chat. You can always reach out through other networks such as Facebook, Instagram, email to see what else is going on. Or if you have any ideas, suggestions. Now, and I see Anita says she's already shared, so she beat me to the punch. Uh, she knows I'm going to ask everyone to click on that share button so they can all see how much fun we're having with Arizona history. Now, first up is a little Arizona. Well, actually, not so little. We're going to talk about Douglas, Arizona, which has a population of just over 16,000, was founded back in 1901 was originally established because of a smelter site for all those mines that were in Bisbee to give all that ore a place to go and get melted down so that way it could be turned into money or more spendable than just lots of heavy ore. Now, when at first, ah, see, Pam, yeah, Douglas is really cool. And, you know, and if you go down there, I mean, you it's such a great little town because of that history and the money that was there. You've got the amazing Gas and Hotel, which did close for a short period of time, but is now reopened again. And they are slowly remodeling all the rooms. And it's quite spectacular. There's a great little restaurant in there as well. So it's a great place to check out. And I think if I remember correctly, all those windows are Tiffany windows. You can also go visit the Grand Theater, which is said to have been the best theater in the West, built in the late 1900, um, 1920s, when it opened up. It opened up 1919. Oh, and they're also known for Sonoran Dogs. That's good to know, Pam. So there's lots of great places. As well as I think they do all kinds of cool things, like you can go to the car museum, the art car world, and see all kinds of cars that have been really reworked and are pretty amazing and are works of art in themselves, much like those Tiffany windows. So Pam, did I miss anything? I know you seem to have, it looks like you work there for a while. So, I mean, there's lots of cool stuff. I mean, I know I've got a couple of friends we've been talking about doing an event down there. So I know they're trying to do more and more to get more people there. 
I mean, like we were talking about the Grand Theater, they just remodeled it. So I haven't seen pictures of the inside yet. So I'm intrigued to see what that looks like. So Douglas is a great place. It's also close by Bisbee. So you could do a little tag team, kind of a progressive vacation. Oh, Pam, I don't know. I'll have to look up the, the Pancho Villa story. So, well, you know, it wouldn't be a happy hour without PJ doing some of his amazing work. And so because it is Psycho Day, this is actually the first photo he sent me when he was creating the cocktail. And it was, and so he is calling this stabbing watermelon. And so what kinds of things are in a stabbing watermelon? Well, you've got a little bit of watermelon vodka, a little bit of watermelon juice, blood orange juice because of Psycho. Anso Reyes, so it's a little spicy with some lemon, lime, and agave. And so the great thing about PJ is he just provides just like this and i just do that oh and he measured that out pretty good so that i don't mm. and so the cool thing about working with pj is so on saturday we're going to be down at majestic theater down in tempe and if you like the idea of the sound of the stabbing watermelon That will be available because I'm doing a little kind of a little pre-talk about Psycho and some of the history of it here in Arizona, as well as just some of the unknown facts about it. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And you can get yourself a stabbing watermelon right there. So tonight we have a special guest on, not unusual. And so it is my friend, William Eaton. Hello. Hey, Marshall. How are you doing? I am good in yourself. Good. So, so William, where are you? I'm at uh, Roberto Venn School Luthery. I'm at the uh, guitar making school. Been here all day. Ah, now that's over on Grand Avenue. Yes, we're 10th Avenue and Grand. Kind of a little arts district happening over here. Indeed. I know. It's like we just had First Friday, so there's lots of stuff going on over there. Yeah, it's exciting. You know, we 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 uh, worked for years on a project with City of Tempe and signed a development agreement. But when the economy went south, uh, the plug kind of got pulled and we looked for another place and looked in industrial areas all over the Phoenix Valley and found this place, which turns out to be a real gem. We we love it here. We've been here since 2011. Oh, I didn't realize you'd been there that long in that space. That's really cool. It seems new to me because we were on 16th Street for 26 years and uh, right. on Washington Street for, what, uh, 15 years before that. So this seems like it still seems like a new place to me. <laughs> but it was uh, well for a bit longer. But. but it's a historic building that we're in. It's uh, yes, no, it is. That's why I was so happy. To, I remember when you guys moved in, we were so happy that you were bringing such an important place to Grand Avenue and helping save a building. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's two courses of brick and there, this has been everything from a produce place to a furniture store to this tire store for years. So it's built in the thirties. So it's been here, you know, quite a long time and been home to many things and we're, we're really happy and uh, settled in here by now. Indeed. Well, you know, I know we're going to do some trivia. Now, when we do trivia, it's not like bar trivia where you just come in and you just get the answer and you leave. We're going to go through all the questions, answers, and then we're going to talk about and tell the stories of all those answers. So they're all multiple choice. So in case you don't know the answer, all you got to do is take a guess and you might get it right. Now we don't, you score yourself, so we trust you to do that. And, you know, you can keep track of those scores. Some folks do on a pad and paper. Some folks have done it also in the question, in the chat session right here. 
So whatever you would like to do, that's good for us. All right. So our first question, what is the longest running guitar making school in North America and where is it located? Is it A, the Langan Luthiery School in Virginia? B, the Academy of Guitar Making in Rhode Island? C, the School of Musical Instrument Crafts in California? Or D, Roberto Venn School of Luthiery right here in Arizona? So while people are locking in what they think their answer is, we're going to go on to question two. All right. What is the predecessor of the Roberto Venn School of Luthiery? Is it the Make and Take Guitar School? B, Guitar Work? C, Custom String Builders? Or D, Music Maker Workshop? All right. Moving on to question three. Who is Roberto or Juan Roberto? Was it A, John Venn? B, John Roberts? C, Juan Roberto? Or G, or D, John Gambus? So one of those people was Juan Roberto. Who do you think it was? And then who is Bob Venn and what legends did he work for? A, Leo Fender. B, Semi Mosley. C, Tiny Moore. Or D, Norm Hamlet. While you're trying to figure out which legends Bob Venn worked for, we're going to go to that hump question, question five. In 1975, William Eaton and who were the founders of Roberto Venn School of Luthiery? Is it A, John Roberts? B, Robert, um, Bob Venn? C, Bruce Scotton? Or D, all of the above? All right, coming down the slope of the questions. What instrument was not built by William Eaton? A, a harp guitar. Now, you're, now we're going to have to help me with the pronunciation on B. O'Aylan. O'Aylan strings. Ah, O'Aylan strings. Or showbud guitar. Or D, a spiral clef. So which of those was not built by William Eaton? All right. What is the oldest recording label in Phoenix? And I think we can probably even safely say the world that's still operating. And A, is it audio recorders? B, the slope records? C, Kenyon records? Or D, Fervor records? So which of those is the oldest recording label here in Phoenix? All right, question eight. Who was the first non-native recording artist signed with Canyon Records? Was it A, Linda Ronstadt? B, William Eaton? C, Hans Olsen? Or D, River Jones? So who do you think the first non-native recording artist over at Canyon was? All right. Question nine, almost at the end. What two well-known Arizona historians that both share the first same first name? Would that be A, John Dixon and Legend? Or Marshall Shore and Trimble? Jack August and Dempsey? Or D, Charlotte Church and Hall? All right, while you're trying to figure that one out, we're going to move on to the very last question. Where does a graduate of the school, Luthiery Guitar Maker Guitar Repair Tech, work? A, guitar manufacturing companies. B, repair shops. C, touring road tech. Or D, all of the above. 
All right. So while you are all trying to lock in your final answers, we are going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break and talk about Lewis Nash. Lewis Nash was born here actually in just a few weeks is his birthday on December 30th. He early on developed an interest in music, began playing the drums at the age of 10 by the age of 18, he was running around town playing drums for all kinds of local jazz groups. He then decided to move off to New York City, where he then signed up with some famous musicians, as well as in the mid-80s, was asked to be part of Branford Marsalis' group, which he did. So he now teaches with AESU, but if you go downtown, you will find the Nash, which is a great jazz place. That's a nonprofit that he started to really help educate and promote jazz. So there's lots of performances that go on there, as well as a lot of teaching moments, traveling artists come through and present there. They also have had some art shows there as well. So it's a fun place to hang out and you never know quite what to expect from the crowd. All right. So who is ready for some answers? All right. So William, what is the longest running guitar making school in North America and where is it located? Well, I think everybody probably got the answer to that just by cueing the guest, <laughs> me. And I'm wearing a Roberto Venn t-shirt and a hat. So kind of giving away that. Yeah, we started in 75. So, uh, we are the longest running school in North America, maybe the world. I'm not sure. We're the only accredited school of guitar making to my oh, knowledge. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. We became accredited in 1979 um, and uh, also approved for veterans. So we have students uh, from all over the world who've come to the guitar making school here, except Antarctica. We've, we've had somebody from every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> So if there's anybody out there that's from Antarctica, you know, send your send your good friends and relatives. We want to sign them up. Nice. Yeah. So we've we've been uh, we, we started. Um, yeah. So some of these photos, um, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if you've seen. Well, I see the one kind of just to the right in the middle that you see a couple of Quonset huts. That one uh, is where we, that's, that's my first, uh, that's, where, that's where we started, 1975. And um, we were there until 1986. Uh, and so um, that was a lot of fond memories there. I, I walked into that shop in 71 um, looking for a guitar to buy. I, I spent the summertime looking for the perfect guitar and couldn't find it. And, uh, I was returned to uh, my classes at ASU and a guy was going door to door to sell this handmade guitar he made. And it was, it was lovely. I really liked it. I thought, I almost thought about buying it on the spot and I thought I want to go over to where he made it and check out the other guitars because I think um, maybe there's a better one. So I uh, uh, went over to the shop and I, I, uh, inquired about the guitars and they said oh well we don't have any guitars here but why don't you make your own and i remember going home that evening and thinking well gosh when when would i have this opportunity you know so i was uh i was studying in the business school there at asu and um i thought you know this this is kind of a one one chance in a lifetime so i i i signed up and started making uh, uh making guitars at the time, it was uh, Juan Roberto Guitar Works, so just gave away one of the answers. But I think everybody, <laughs> I, I think they, I think your viewers have locked in their answers. All right, all right. They have so no going back and changing, especially Miss Cindy Lee, because I know she's a little shifty, so she might change her answers, but probably no one else will. Well, some of the first questions revolve really about, and you know, you're you're a historian, so I thought you'd appreciate some of these old things because um, I mean, this is my 50th year as a guitar maker. So I'm kind of celebrating my 50th year starting in 1971. Uh, but the school was founded in 1975 and um, kind of uh, a, a tr 
uh, serendipitous route. Um, so, and, and I'll, yeah, I'll talk about John when we get to his question, but um, I, I, when I built that first guitar, I thought it'd just be a once in a lifetime experience. I love the guitar, played it, and kind of renewed my interest in the guitar because I'd sold all my equipment and my guitars. And when I, when I got to graduate school uh, at Stanford, I still imagined a life in investment banking, commercial banking, some, some financial institution and uh, second year there, I had, uh, had this vivid dream about building a second guitar. And I knew I had three weeks coming up for the break. And I thought, I'm going back to Phoenix. I'm gonna call John and see if I can come down and build a, a second guitar. And I had drawn it out after I had this dream about it. It's a 12 string. And, um, and he said, yeah, come on down. Two days later in a class at Stanford, I was given the assignment to write a business plan and it could be fictitious or real. And I thought, hmm, I gotta get to school. I'm going down there for three weeks. So I can gather materials. When I built my first guitar, John, Roberts knew I was studying business at ASU and always was asking me, he says, why don't you join up with us? You know, and I, I just didn't see that as a realistic um, uh, occupation. And, but then at, at grad school, you know, some of my instructors said, you know, it was kind of like that first guitar opportunity. When, when we have a chance to start an entrepreneurial guitar school, you know, just do it. And if it doesn't work out, you know, you can, you can get a job with McKinsey, consulting group or Boston or, you know, big institutions. And, uh, but I, I chose to, to go the entrepreneurial route and uh, got to know John and Bob. I sent them the business plan I wrote and they said, yeah, come on down. Let's, let's do it. And that was, uh, I finished up the spring of 75 and we, we uh, actually went through all the incorporation work to get that all taken care of. And in June 75, we were off and running and started our first class. That one, that collage of pictures you showed, there's, there's one uh, with the first class. I snapped the photo. If you see that one, it's. Oh, is that the, this one there? Um, oh, let's see. Do you have a cursor on it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the one. It, it, it kind of looks in the desert. That's across the street from the Quonset huts. Um, oh, my gosh. Still, that's right in Phoenix. It's, um, you know, just real close to Salt River Project where that is still. And that was at a time in the late 60s, early 70s, you could still sense a little bit the, the distance between Phoenix and Tempe because Washington Street was the old highway. That's where we were at. And uh, if you walked across the street, it was like you had this little desert area and then a little to the north, you've got Papago Park. But that's kind of a motley crew there for sure. And um, as I'm looking at, I see Richard Cordes. I see Steve Anderson, who's uh, one of the best guitar makers in the world. He's doing archtop guitars and, and famous for his mandolins and uh, Joe Godla and Dave Moore, um, Neil Tapp. There's a bunch of guys that uh, have had real successful careers as well as 2,800 other graduates. So it's, uh, it's kind of really satisfying to see, see uh, them in the up, upper right-hand corner. You've got Terry McInturf uh, working there at the school shop there. He's, he's a famous guitar maker, makes his own one. That sign in the middle, uh, Roberto Venn School sign, that's that's at our the second property that we were on, South 16th Street. And <clears throat> there is, uh, and the one below that is the old workshop uh, that was uh, near the Quonset. So we've occupied three different buildings in all that time. And uh, it's been it's been a good run, very, very enjoyable lifestyle. So how long does it take someone to make a guitar? Well, it depends who's making it. You know, the factories can make one in a day or two. Uh, and, and, and I was having a conversation with one of our grads yesterday and, and they're putting together about 2000 guitars a year. So they're coming off, uh, you know, and they have kind of an assembly. Our individual builders um, are building, the graduates are building anywhere from a dozen to 30 or 40 a year. Um, our students, when they come, Marshall, there uh, in our, our flagship course we've had ever since the beginning is a five. It's now is a five month course. Started as a four month course. They're building one acoustic and one electric guitar. And if there's any viewers out there that are considering a little life change, boy, come on down. Visit the school. Um, our next course starts in February, and um, we have 
as I said, I mentioned students from all over the, the globe. We've also had a diversity of students, not just their nationalities and ethnicities, but um, uh, guys, gals, uh, different age groups. We've been having a lot of people showing up in their 50s and 60s and even 70s. We've had a couple students in their 70s uh, that were always interested in guitar and uh, had a career and they said, you know, I want to try something else. And it's, it's, it's kind of cool because they're, you can kind of tell they, they took on a job that was made sense for them financially. And now uh, they've, they kind of have that solved and said, you know, I'm, I want to do something I really love and have some passion to do. So that's pretty cool. Nice. All right. So what was the predecessor to the Roberto Vin School of Luthieri? Yeah, Juan Roberto Guitar Works. And that's the old sign that it was actually mounted on the Quonset hut. So when I went over there the first time, I said, Juan Roberto Guitar Works, kind of this mystical place. And I say that because, the you know, when you walk through those arched uh, Quonset hut, it really was kind of, you know, you, you, there's nothing like it. You know, if, if you look, you know, the history, those were designed for military operate or uh, establishments. And there was one over a little north of Tempe, south of Scottsdale that had about seven or eight of them that were a military installation. Maybe at Williams, there was some and, and I've seen them, you know, on my bike rides. There's one in, in South Phoenix that's um forget the name it's southwest something and they have a quonset that's very much like the one we have we had vintage but when i walked in there the first time the smells is what i i remember most the rosewood the uh, nicaraguan oh. rosewood such, such a distinct smell you never forget it and seeing all these guitars in process and i wonder if any of your viewers are former Juan Roberto, because it was Juan Roberto Guitar Works, and then there was another sign underneath it. That was the name of the, the business. Build your own guitar. And so when I'd go into work on a guitar, I'd see people, um, you know, doctors and lawyers and, and teachers and uh, all professions going in at night. John kept the shop open till midnight and open on Mondays and Tuesdays, or no, closed Mondays, Tuesdays, opening Saturday and Sunday. People just go and build their own guitar. So Juan Roberto Guitar Works is kind of a fascinating place um, uh, back in the day. And, I, you know, there's not many parallels that I've found. You know, it, it, the people early learning in the 60s or 70s taught themselves or the, if they were lucky enough to get an apprenticeship, they would learn. So it's kind of a unique thing that happened uh, here in Phoenix Indeed. All right. So you've talked a little bit about who was Juan Roberto, but who was he? Juan Roberto uh, is a real character. Uh, he, I, his story kind of starts, um, well, the guitar store story, I think, starts in the air. He was in the Air Force and he flew the big bombers. He was in line to actually he did missions to dropping the uh, nuclear bomb. On Japan. Fortunately, he he didn't. He always was so thankful. Like he was second or third in line for that mission. Wow. And so he learned in the Air Force how to fly airplanes and repair them. And after the war, he got a gig with a produce company in Southern California. Um, and then um, and was flying to Nicaragua, met the Robinson Lumber Company there and took a job with them as their executive pilot. So he was flying the pilots around the region to some of it just to spot um, ro uh, patches of wood um, that they would be milling. And at one point he got interested in, um, in building a yacht. <laughs> and this, if you knew John Roberts, he had a different scheme every day, you know, from fo frog farms to you name it. He, he, was, he was eclectic and a character. And, and in his mind, he was going to build, he met this boat builder and they're going to build a yacht. So he, um, he's friends with the mosquito people. These are the indigenous uh, people from that region. I found kind of a contemporary photo that I sent you of the mosquito people. And those, those folks, uh, he befriended them and he would trade supplies to them. He would uh, uh, give them things that he would get from the commissary there in exchange for them going out into the jungle and milling this, getting this wood for him. And so as a pilot, he's flying over all these regions and he spots trees that have been, already been cut um, 
by the lumber company, they want straight grain, which is kind of up beyond the trunk and, and below the crotch. So the wood that they left over is the real pretty stuff because in crotches, in, in branches that branch out and in, uh, root, right. in root systems, you get real interesting figure. And that's what he wanted for his boat. And so they would go in the jungle and they would, um, they would find a bit, huge mahogany tree. Now, if you see this table here, this is a huge, what John called a gamba, if, if your viewers can see this. So, um, and, and you're seeing just part of it. This is a huge table. It goes all the way across the room. And this, if you imagine this 90 degrees, this was the mahogany root. And so the root. Um, oh, my gosh, they, that's a root? This is a root, yeah. Turn it 90 degrees. And the mahogany trees have a very thin root, and some of them are very straight. Some of them kind of curve. They are buttress roots that basically are uh, biologically designed, evolving that tree to withstand hurricanes and major windstorms. So these roots go out in the desert or into the jungle, um, you know, 10, 20 yards. And um, so these, these mosquito people that, that went out there, they take a little two-man saw, one on each side of the root. They cut down, and you can actually see where it was cut on this root. And then they would dig a trench and cut it along the, the ground line. And they'd have this, what they call a gamba, just a big root. They tied it to bamboo, put it in the river, float it down for, to a drop-off point, And John collected a huge amount of these mahogany roots and then also rosewood um, and lots of varieties of rosewood. Uh, one of the photos I sent you was John with the um, United Nations uh, hardwood survey. They surveyed... Um, yeah, it's that top one just to the right of who is Juan Roberto and he's on the right. And these other uh, guys are in that photo. were part of um, a survey uh, to look into hardwoods in that area. And he was part of that team. They, they, I saw the book that they published. Uh, it's huge, you know, cause there's, there's literally over 500 varieties of, of trees just in that locale there. And then you see the boat there in the river. So they, they would, they would put this, uh, these things in the river, get them down there. And then the bottom right-hand corner is uh, John with those gambas and gives you a size, you know, if you see him. Yeah. Um, they are very large. And, and in the beginning, um, you know, he, so he gets all this wood and then the boat builder runs off. He's, he, he's got, what am I going to do with all this wood I've collected? And his wife is having eye problems. I learned it. Um, through letters after John passed away, he was in dialogue with the, the Robinson Lumber Company and their, their um, airplane that he was flying had mechanical issues and repair issues. And you see three letters <laughs> where he's trying to get this solved and get these parts and with no real answer. And I, I, he never told me this, but I believe he came back to Phoenix partly to help his wife Dottie with her eye issues. And partly he had all this wood. What am I going to do with it? And partly because he was getting concerned about flying this plane. So he puts all this wood on a boat to New Orleans. In New Orleans, they loaded onto three boxcars. It filled three box. You know how big a boxcar is a train. Yeah. A huge amount of wood. Ships it to Phoenix. Gets here. Gets a front end loaders and, uh, and forklifts. And moves it to a place uh, not far from where we are now on Harvard Street. Um, just on the other side of Central. And was there for a few years, then found that old Quonset, moved all the wood over there. And he started an import hardware, hardwood business. And it was John Roberts Import Hardwoods. And uh, John wasn't really a business guy. He didn't, he didn't have much success with the import hardwood business. But two guys uh, met him, Carl Samuels and um, Dwayne Reeder. Uh, and I think one other, one other gentleman. And they were guitar makers. And they said, you, John, you've got a Fort Knox of wood. This stuff is prime guitar making wood. They taught him how to make guitars. And John, oh. did, and now John Roberts is a guitar maker. <laughs> He's not a boat builder anymore. And, uh, and then, you know, Carl, his buddy is teaching out at, uh, at, uh, uh, Glendale Community College, and he's, he actually teaching a guitar course. He says, you know, the young kids today, all these young hippies, you know, they will just come to your place in droves, just open it up. And so he did. That's when he decided to start Juan Roberto Guitar Works and, and have people like myself in 1971. He had done it for another a year before that, two years before that. And people come in off the street, as he would say, and build their guitar. 
And so that's 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 John's history. He, he's he's really the reason we're here. Just that um, unusual circumstance of events. So then, are you still using that wood? We we use a little bit of it. Uh, we went, you know, in the '70s and '80s, we were using that predominantly. And by the time we got to the late '80s, um, we were finding, you know, a lot of a lot of wood, wood was checked. And because it's so dry in Arizona, it all should have been cut originally and stickered. And that was a huge task. John never undertook that task. And uh, so, but we still have some here at the school and we're starting to mill some of it. We just, uh, Robert, one of my instructors, Robert Mazzullo, just finished uh, a set design that we made upstairs that we're going to do our videos from. And, and he used the back wall, all uh, mahogany from Nicaragua wow. and the table Tabletop is Nicaragua. It's beautiful. Um, so that's that's really going to be a, a real addition to the programs and things we offer. So, um, so we still we still use that. We get wood from all over the world. Um, one of our one of our graduates is uh, in a fam an Indian family um, that uh, o o oversees traders, and their specialty is hardwoods for uh, musical instruments. And. Oh. Uh, um, uh, on kit Yogi came here. His grandfather started the company. So he's third in line to run this huge company. It was fascinating. We were so honored to have him here. Um, and, um, and we get, you know, get wood from, you know, almost anywhere you can think of this including, including local hardwood dealers. So it's, uh, the students are learning things from, from scratch. You know, there's no kits. They learn everything about the wood milling all the way through the course to understand the different parts of the instrument, why the, why different woods sound the way it does and, and how the, the bracing will affect the sound and everything throughout the instrument. Oh, so it's not just how to make, but also why and even like the science of the wood that you're using. Yes. And the intuition that's developed when you when you are feeling the wood and, and flexing it and learning you know these properties and 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 my instructors uh my partner john reuter was signed on with us in 85 and he's been my longtime partner and and my good friend bart applewhite uh is my apprentice and really runs the day-to-day -day school operations and does really well and he's a great maker john's a great guitar maker bart makes uh, uh basses and harp basses uh, our two key guys right now are uh, steve Davis and Jim Prater, uh, they've been at with us over 10 years. They are fantastic builders, great teachers. Um, and we have Mark Allred, who's a local musician and went through the school. And, and um, he's, he started with us part time, but now he's, he's a full time instructor with us. Uh, we've got oh, workshop. nice. Brady's our workshop assistants. And, and upstairs, Robert Mazzullo is running our repair classes and our advanced build classes. Robert worked for us um, for many years, then, then opened his own shop, Mud Guitars, and uh, was doing some high-end cabinet work and called me one day and said, I'd like to come back to work for the school. And I said, we'd love to have you back. Let's figure out something. And we had been working on a repair program and said, that would be the perfect course for you to teach. Um, Joe Valley, I think you know Joe. Indeed, uh, I do know Joe quite well. Yeah, I found some old photos of Joe. I, it was too late to send them. I found this old Aww. photo. You got to see some pictures of Joe in nineteen. You should still send them. I, I will. I will I'll, tease him. I'll send him because uh, he's he's just a punk, you know. And he's this is nineteen seventy nine, I think, when he came to school or seventy eight. Uh, but Joe has been a real successful repair tech builder uh he he was uh, the doobie brothers road tech uh pat simmons in specifically and pat is playing one of his joe valley guitars and he's he's worked on triggered uh that's uh willie nelson's famous guitar with the holes in it and worked for steve miller and lots of famous people so uh, we have a lot of connections in the guitar world indeed all right, so we've talked about one. Now let's talk about Bob Venn and which legends did he know? Yeah, so Bob uh, met John in 1973. Bob lived in Bakersfield, California, and that's where he honed his craft as a guitar, uh, electric guitar builder and repair guy. And he moved down to Arizona to Mesa, and somebody said, you got to go check out John Roberts. So he, 
He met John in 73. The two of them went into partnership. And that's really formed the beginning of this, what was going to become the school. So Bob worked there. Um, and previous coming to Arizona, um, he, he, uh, he, I, he didn't work for Fender, but he knew Leo and, and learned a, a bit about finishing from Leo, the Leo Fender and his company. Semi Mosley is Mosrite Guitars. Anybody that's been around guitars for a long time, I mean, they've since uh, went out of business many, many years ago. But Semi, uh, at one time, the Mosrite Guitars were, were right up there. They were, you know, not as well known as Fender. Uh, Tiny Moore is a mandolin player in the country world and, if, uh, and, and really a great player. And, and Bob made, um, I, th I think, one or, or several uh, mandolins for Tiny. Norm Hamlet um, is a, a very well-known resonator player that Bob made a, an instrument for. Um, Bob kind of knew a lot of people in the country world through his, his connections in Bakersfield. Um, so a lot of country players would come into Phoenix. They'd play down at the Phoenix uh, Symphony Hall um, or various venues, and they'd come over to school. Uh, Merle Haggard, for example, and Norm, Norm played with Merle. Um, so we have these famous people walking in the shop. Um, Bob Dylan was there one day. I, I wasn't there on that day. Leo Kotke, many others that just came by. But Bob um, specialized in electric guitars. So this brought to the partnership uh, John's uh, abilities with acoustic and Bob with electric. So the foundation of the school is about teaching people the art of making acoustic. Making the jobs that they're going to get. Um, so, uh, so Bob was there. And when I wrote the business plan in the let's see, winter of 74, spring of 75. Um, Bob certainly was part of that process. When I went down there and interviewed him and, and got all the information and inventory and, and really researching what, this, what, what, what they were doing at the present time and how we would reimagine a formalized school, um, Bob was an important part of that process. And they were my seniors. So it's funny, back in the business plan, I think I had like 10 schools opened up by year five. <laughs> that never wow. happened. Um, those guys, you know, they had their own vision and they, they're both a couple of stubborn, cantankerous guys, you know, in some ways. So they didn't they didn't want a youngster like me tell them what was going to happen. So it was kind of an interesting relationship. It did free me up to work on my instruments, which then became my main focus. I, I realized that... Um, you know, the, the business of the school didn't take, didn't require a lot of my time because it's, you know, it's a pretty small operation. And here I'm doing case studies on fortune 500 companies. And then I come and start this little teeny cottage industry school. But it, it you know, the first two years when I moved to Arizona, I, I didn't have a home. I lived in the desert. I walk out there and, uh, where I had a car, I had a Citroen station wagon. And, and I, I, I use that time to understand what it takes to live in the desert. Learned all about the plant life, what plants you can eat, the medicinal value of, of creosote and jojoba beans and any number of plants in the desert. Um, prickly pear, cactus fruit. I ate a lot of, I still do eat a lot of mesquite pods, Palo Verde beans in season. And it was a real education. And when you sleep on the desert floor every night, and um, just like this time of year, you know, you, I, I know that where the sun sets because of the tilt of the earth. And of course, indigenous stories are, are not solar centric. They're the earth is the earth. And you, when you see the sun goes down and there's some interesting places around the valley, people may not know they're sun markings. So uh, the indigenous people of this region would mark on the stones um, as the sun goes, gets lower and lower in the sky. Because uh, that's the whole solstice event is, and all the indigenous stories about how do we bring the sun back? Because as it gets lower and lower, and you visually watch that, there's a certain fear factor built in. Because you know you see the arc getting lower and lower, and you say, what if it just goes away? You know, is it going to be night all the time? Because the days are getting longer. So these markings would be something where they would show. And imagine, imagine the sun and angle at which the sunlight comes in. And you make this mark each day. And as the sun gets further lower in the horizon, 
the markings uh, ascend or descend accordingly to where, where you have on the rock formations. And there's some fascinating places in the desert where you find this. And then on the solstice day at the fa final mark, that's as far, as far as it gets. And then when they observe the sun starting to go the other way, oh, hallelujah, you know, the, the shorter days are over. Um, and uh, the best experience I had that is out in the Boulder House. I don't know if you've ever seen that place, but it's actually built in the boulders. And Sonny Empey, who lived there, became an archaeoastronomer. And she noted um, a unique happening that I witnessed personally, a very transformational thing. Uh, their house had a concrete floor, but in 1,000, 2,000 years ago, it just would have been desert gravel. On the equinox day, uh, actually a beam of light starts to perceptively move across the floor, which again would have been the desert floor. And you watch that light move across the floor in about, it takes about an hour to get to this stone. And when it gets to the stone, the stone has an etching of a spiral. And when it reaches up to the, to, on the stone, all of a sudden, in a flash, the light goes and vanishes. So each edge of that spiral is designed uh, by what you, you know, these, these, you call them primitive, but boy, what an observation. Yeah. The spiral catches the light at each point as it's moving very slowly. But when it gets close to the end, that light is just grasped imperceptibly by the spiral and it's, 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 it's like magic, you know, and, and I've only, that's the only one I've found of those varieties. I've seen lots of other sun marking places, but um, that's i uh, I'm getting off tangent though. I'm getting way away from the question. No, but that's fascinating. I'm like, I want to go see it. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's part of my history. I was, I was, I love the desert, still love the desert. And uh, it's a very habit of, uh, easy place to live in, I would say, when you understand, you know, the, uh, I mean, the temperature, you know, I had a sleeping bag and a ground cloth that I could use as a rain guard and I didn't need much. And it was, uh, um, a really, a, a really great lifestyle for those few, few years and, and really learning, learning lots of things about, um, about ourselves as being human. You know, it's, it was the, the beginning of my interest in sustainability and environmental issues because you see how symbiotic it is and, and what functions that we have as human beings um, that uh, we have these attributes that I didn't wasn't even aware of you know like uh, um, walking barefoot every day and and you'd think well how, how do you do that in a desert well when you build up a pad on your feet that's the design and and the, and the best thing you can do for your feet is walk uh, barefooted because that's our human design and when you get to a place where you can run in the desert on the rocks and stuff barefooted, then you're there, you know, and it's, it's, it's not as hard as you think, it, you know, if, if nobody, if you started from scratch, you have to build up that pad on your foot. But the bigger thing is with that is you have all the nerve endings in the feet. So you really become grounded in a different way, literally um, with the amperage ah. charge from the earth and the solar effects of that. So it's, it's, uh, there's some unique things that you learn. Um, uh, that might be another subject matter because that, well and it's, it's interesting when you talk about this it's like i'm thinking of like frank lloyd wright who um in the architecture school up at talias and west would have students go off and build a shelter in the desert that they had to stay in yes and so and i think it's so interesting that i mean that it's like to get in tune with just kind of the location where you were um, i think and also the, the fact that he loved music as well I think that was, we share the same birthday. I've always, always been interested in uh, Frank's uh, architectural elements. And I've played out at Taliesin West many times um, and, um, you know, learned a little bit about his, you know, his philosophy, his perception. And yes, he was very interested in music. And of course, Taliesin West, when you go out there, he, he didn't maximize space because he says, you know, for heating and cooling, we don't want large ceilings and some of those you have to kind of duck to walk in some of the rooms. Right. But they still do. As far as I know, they still do that for the students that they go out in the desert and um, and they build uh, something. I, I And I'm not I don't you know, I've talked with some of the students. Some use entirely desert materials, um, you know, because I live there. I think, well, no problem. You need a sleeping bag and you need maybe a cover, you know. And uh, I felt very comfortable doing that. If, if you had a major storm. Once I, I climbed up on top of Weaver's Needle, which I look at that now and said, that was quite a, it was quite a feat, but I was, I've been up there, I think three or four times and slept over there twice. And one night it snowed up there. 
you know, and all I had oh is my, my gosh. swooping bag. But I, you know, you just curl up and I use the, uh, the ground cloth to cover so I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't land on me and melt. Um, but right. the desert, this, the surrounding desert is, is very accommodating because of the temperatures. It never gets too cold. Now, some people really, you know, it gets 115 or more. That's for some people, that's really tough. I've always been acclimated to heat pretty well. So it's, it hasn't been something I've, I've had too much problem with. All right, William. So who were the other founders of the original Maruto Venn School of Luthiery? The answer is all of the above. Bruce Scotton was at, when, when I came down and brought the business plan, Bruce was part of it, he, for, but he lasted one or two classes. Um, and he had, what I didn't know at the time, one of his good friends, Mike Lennon, had built a guitar at Juanberto Guitar Works. And he and Mike were but buddies and they moved to Nashville and started their own shop called it the apprentice shop and they actually offered uh, um, education for students too. So they were, um, I, they were doing a smaller scale school, but really great guy Bruce was and Mike his, and I got to know both of them and we really miss Bruce leaving. Um, so it left a little bit of a hole cause he was very knowledgeable uh, and uh um, pretty early on in the first class, Dave Moore, one of our first in our first class, stayed on with this. And he was great. He's one of the best instructors we've ever had. Really patient, really, really bright, um, really understood the building process. So our history of a school has, you know, I named the, the, the folks that are involved now, but we've gone through, gosh, maybe close to, I want to say 50, 60 instructors. It's been a lot over the years. Wow. And they've all, every one of them have gone through the school program. So they know about the school and we've, we've had some excellent talent through the years. All right. So which of those instruments did you not build? Well, the showbud guitar, and we talked earlier because I was, when we talked on the phone, I was curious how much you knew about showbud. So, um, I've, uh, and, and for those who don't aren't familiar with my work, um, I, I make a lot of different stringed instruments. But the showbud guitar is a is a pedal steel. It's the one that's you visually you see it right underneath the spiral clef, and it's um, it's it's quite a unique instrument. Um, I've thought about building one. I just I've never done it. But the pedal steel has more mechanics to it. So the showbud though is uh, bud. Uh, it was originally uh, shot Jackson and he had contacted Bud Isaacs and Bud was a great steel player and he wanted Bud to be part of this business. Uh, Bud was um, not interested. Uh, he and his wife, Jerry um, came to the school many times. They were good friends with Bob uh, and we got to know Bud and Jerry and they would do these little concerts for us. It was awesome. People would come in and, uh, so when Bud Isaacs wasn't interested, uh, uh, Shot Jackson asked uh, Bud, I, uh, Bud, Buddy Emmons, both of them first name Bud. So that's the show Bud. And, and Buddy, oh. Buddy was a friend of uh, Bob Benz as well. So, so I, because, you know, I thought, uh, you know, you, for the trivia question, you put in there to throw anybody else if, if they saw the show Bud. And I don't know how many of your listeners. To my knowledge, though, I, I didn't. I was going to look it up today, but I know there was two of the three of the steel or the pedal steel guitar, guitar companies were here right in Phoenix. This is an interesting tidbit of history that you might make a note about because Rustler, Rustler Steel, Pedal Steel, and and ZB, just the letter ZB. <clears throat> I was at the ZB shop. Um, that would have been in the seventies, and Arizona has this uh, quite the history of uh, of pedal steel. Um, including the conference that happens, I think every other year, maybe it used to be every year. Um, and some of the best steel players come to Arizona for that. Wow. But then I know, so you've built these other guitars. Yeah. Those are some historic photos there. I didn't have any photos taken of me for 10 or 11 years, um, except these that were going to go into a, that went into a brochure and also the first and second recording that I made, the first one is an LP in 77. And then I made a cassette in 79, came out, I think, in 80. 
And so these pictures were taken. And those, uh, there's a double neck quadraphonic guitar. There's an Oalen strings out in the fields there with the flowers and then a, a harp guitar. Oh. Um, so, uh, it, the, 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 the double neck there was one of my first instruments where I said, you know, I want more than six strings. And so everything after that was um, unique shapes, designs to accommodate more strings and, you know, include different sounds with the instruments. Well, and then I know you've built some other things. Yeah, I don't know if you can show the viewers. Yeah, so here's, here's I've built quite a few different ones and I sent to Marshall a few of them. Um, in the upper left hand is that guitar is holding, I call that a Koto harp guitar. Uh, there is a Lyra harp guitar uh, there, third from the left, and then a, another shot of the, uh, the harp, the, the Koto harp guitar. In the upper right is the, is the instrument that I'm playing most often now. Uh, it is um, technologically advanced, I will say. It has a computer that's built into it that was designed by Neil Skin, a really great designer. And um, it allows the strings to be tuned by pushing buttons. So the computer, oh, wow. the computer basically is calibrated to memorize where step motors are going to stop. The step motors um, uh, tighten or loosen the strings. At the nut position of the guitar, it's it's uh, the the locking nut holds the strings in place. And down at the bridge end, um, with a roller bridge, there is uh, there's these servo motors will will tighten the string or loosen. So physically, you're actually moving strings within a second or two. And um, it's quite a unique new thing. And I, so I designed the instrument around that. And then the other neck has uh, synthesizer capabilities. So I can make that sound like a banjo or piano or drums or you name it. And then there's some harp strings. Um, the, the guitars, the three guitars that are like are electric harp guitar I designed. And um, viewers that are interested can look up electric harp guitar group. EGG is the acronym E-H-G-G. So the egg group, um, and we have some videos out there. Those, these are um, an extended scaling. So they're a little deeper sound, a little richer sound. It's not a baritone guitar. It's tuned um, a whole step lower than your, your traditional guitar and with extra harp strings. So uh, those, are, those are pretty unique. The one on the left is the one I'm working on now that's in process. Ah, it's a, okay. it's a Fibonacci spiral sequence. And um, there's banks of strings on that. And there's colorful woods that fit in between those spaces there. And it'll, it'll get sc more sculptural as I, as I work more on that one. So is that going to have six sets of strings on it? It has six banks of strings. And th the real difference on this one, um, viewers looking at that say, hmm, the lines, um, they, they, um, uh, they, they emerge to a central point in that center there. So the strings actually come together and they're really, um, they're close. And so I have one instrument, it's called a spiral clef. I don't know if you have a picture of that. I sent you a picture of that. It has strings really close together. So when you strum them, it's a, this glissando effect. And I use it like a raga instrument. If you hear, if those who are in, uh, have heard a sitar. So the playing string on a sitar has this buzz because it's mounted on what's called a jawari bridge which is a very slight concave. The string comes across that just enough where it wants to buzz on that bone. So that sound. Right. Not easy to get, as you might imagine, but um, that spiral clef has two of those jewelry bridges. So I can play raga style music and then the strings are real close. And when you strum them, if I use my thumbnail to strum them in the back or the ones on the bottom, you get this interesting cascade of, of strings that, that move across there. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have an instrument where I could do that more than one bank of strings? So that's what this is. So the strings converge. Oh. I pluck each of those each of those uh, fretboards. It'll sound it'll sound like one harmonic chord. And if I move up the fretboard, I can play the strings individually. So it's, I'll have options with that. So it's 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 very. I will say I've never seen anything quite like that design because most of them take for the other way so that your fingers have room to play um, the, the instrument. 
uh, and uh, or to, to pick the instrument because these will be real close closely uh, aligned. Wow, that's going to sound really amazing. I think so. I'm working on the back of it now. Uh, it's 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 moving along a little bit, but it's uh, the back will be a little deeper, and then um, it's all going to be carved out on the inside to 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 help promote the acoustic sound of it. Originally, it was just going to be a solid body, but then I've re envisioned it, and it's going to have it's won't be like a full acoustic sound, but it's going to it'll give it a little bit more warmth for the, for the sounds that are, that are, that are amplified. Wow. All right. And now what is the order oldest recording label in Phoenix? Canyon records is the right answer. 1951. Um, yeah. The year, I, the year I was born. So I, I, I feel kind of, uh, I know how old they are, how old the label ah, is ah, <laughs> ah. each year. And, and uh, they're still around today. They're still around. Well, in fact, um, so the photos I sent you, like the one to the left, where Robert is between two, um, uh, uh, in, there's inventory in all those shelves. That's Robert Doyle. Um, the picture just to the right of Canyon Records uh, is Ray Boley and Ed Lee Nate. And then you see Nate, Navajo singer. So Ray Boley is doing movies in Phoenix. Phoenix. And if you look at history, um, he a lot of them were commercial, Marshall. So he had people like Ronald Reagan and, and different actors of that era come over to do commercials in Arizona. And so he was filming this, but he, he met Ed, Ed Lee, and became good friends with him. And he loved his voice. He was uh, he sang in Diné, in the, in the Navajo language, and he decided to record him. Um, and he recorded Ed Lee Nate in 1951. They made an LP. That's the found, founding of Canyon Records and with his wife, Mary. And in the, they, they made that LP and they loved going around the desert. They had a little motor home and they'd go all over Arizona selling this record. And they, and they uh, basically established a real network of little curio shops and places around where tourists would stop in to look at you know, Indian jewelry or Navajo rugs or you name it. And here there, here was a, the record. And it was the foundation of, um, I'm pretty sure it would be the first Native American label, uh, which is what Canyon Records is. And beginning with Ray and then Ray started recording other Native artists and powwow groups. And um, it, was, uh, it was the foundation of that. Some of the other pictures that you were showing um, is with my good friend, R. Carlos Nakai. Um, so um, R.C. and I, in the, in the, down in the lower right-hand corner, uh, R.C. is on the left. That's R. Carlos Nakai, uh, the most well-known Native American flute player in the world. He, he's really, he's the premier. He's the guy in, in the 80s who started to use the flute as a really mellifluous instrument um, and, and very melodic and it's phrasing is beautiful and um, we're, the, we're the same vintage. So we learned listening to the same music. And um, we, uh, we met in the eighties at a, an arts conference for um, uh, Arizona Commission on the Arts. And um, we were invited to play for this salon. I don't know if you've ever run into Tom Hulan and Spirit of the Senses, if you- Oh yeah aware of what they do. And so Tom's been a good friend of mine since the seventies. And so I said, yeah, um, we'll uh, knock guy and I'll play for that. And, uh, my, what, who was to become my wife, Christine lamb, I invited her to dance to us and we, we did an improv and it was on Camelback mountain in echo Canyon. Very, you know, uh, interesting place right here in the Valley. Not many people know about. And, um, the very first time we played together, I played a lira and he played, he pulled out a flute and they worked perfectly, which in hindsight was pretty lucky, you know, because his flutes are, the length of them determines uh, the lowest pitch, which is the fundamental of that instrument. You've got an F sharp flute, you've got a G flute, an A, a lower D flute that's longer. And he has a whole series of these flutes. And, and we just, it was, I don't know. It was love at first sight. We just, we played and it just worked so well. And, and um, we said, we should do more of this. And so 
<clears throat> we got together in my studio and did some um, some recordings, some drafts, and we took them to Ray Bowley. Uh, RC had already started with Canyon Records, and he was becoming, you know, pretty well known. Um, and I think he had three albums out before our duo album, which was in 1987. And uh, it's called Carry the Gift. And it, uh, we recorded, I think, in one or two sessions at uh, Jack Miller Studio. That was another photo I put on there. Jack Miller is, has been the engineer for Canyon Records. Um, he passed away just a few years ago. Jack's with, with the blue in the background. He is an amazing individual, uh, was, and one of the greatest engineers in the world. Uh, I can say that. He, he worked for RCA for many years in Southern California recorded everybody from Henry Mancini's band to the Rolling Stones and Love and Spoonful and, and uh, you know, whole bunch of other acts and classical acts, you name it. Um, and then he moved back to Phoenix. He recorded pretty much all of Dwayne Eddy's cat, a catalog. Dwayne Eddy was a pretty famous guitarist in Phoenix. That'd be another historical footnote uh, to look into, but Jack uh, recorded um, pretty much, you know, from the beginning to the end of uh, Canyon's uh, recording thing. There's one picture of me and RC and Will in Red Square. We've been all- Yeah, over I was wondering what was going on with that. Yeah, it's it was, um, we, we did a tour in Russia that was really wonderful. We went to Moscow, of course, but St. Petersburg and Yaroslav and Ekaterinburg with an interpreter. It was a program where it was an exchange program where they sent artists to the States and we, and sending artists from the United States to go over there. Beautiful tour and, and meeting the people that are just so lovely over there. It's, that's the thing about world travels. You know, you meet people and you say, oh, it's kind of the same everywhere. These are beautiful folks, you know, and then politics gets in the way. But uh, it's, uh, that was a, a fun tour. And we, we were actually in the studio two weeks ago. We're making, uh, I think it's our seventh or eighth album. Um, RC and I did three duo albums and then Will Clipman's a good friend of ours. He plays in my ensemble, William Eaton ensemble. Uh, Will is a fantastic percussionist. He's, we call him Canyon's percussionist. He's probably on, I don't know, 20 or 30 albums or maybe more. He's, he's so versatile that he just plays and, and he's, he's really great at what he does. And, uh, so it's a fun trio to work with. And we recorded three days and Robert says, we got enough material. So we're going to mix it in mid-January. It's supposed to come out in April. Excited about that. Nice. Yeah. All right. So I think you may have given a little bit of this away, but indeed you were the first non-native recording artist signed with Canyon Records. I think so. I, you, Robert would be able to tell me that, you know, it's possible, you know, they, uh, I, I don't know offhand now will would you know is like i said is uh and will has a little bit of of native blood and and oh. really researched that and and it turns out all of us have indigenous you know like i think he's related to the samis and i am too and, and I've, I've researched some of mine uh but we you know if if you want to look far my 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 grandfather took us all the way back to uh pre pre-English stuff. And it's interesting, the stuff that he uncovered from Dover, England. But, you know, you go back further than that, all of us have indigenous roots. And that's, I've always felt a kinship and it never was a surprise to me that I was, have been on that label because my, my native friends, uh, RC and, and uh, Robert Tree Cody and Mary Redhouse and Tony Redhouse and, and Tony Duncan, there's a lots of people on the label, uh, uh, Rad Miller Cody uh, that uh, that I've become friends with, and of course RC is a close friend. Um, you know what we share in common is my interest in ethnomusicology, the beginning of the stringed instruments, the the instruments that 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 are that I've made that have the bow in them. That that, that is a, a reference to the shaman's bow, hunter singing bow. So that's the first stringed instrument, one string on there, hunters, you know board or what however they decided to pluck that string and said oh that makes a sound and if it's tighter it makes a higher pitch sound you could you could even and then when you when um, a gourd gets wrapped and attached to that oh it amplifies the sound so our ancestors were playing these um in caves because caves have these beautiful resonant peak frequency places that the echo gets predominant and it's almost this 
magical occurrence where they're hearing their voice repeated to them. And these conversations with the earth develop in these rituals and the cave being the womb of the earth, uh, some really fascinating indigenous oral tradition stories about our earth music experience in underground and how that informed even the, the, the um, cathedrals in Europe uh, that are designed for chanting come out with the same sensibility about sounds in caves and canyons. You, you broadcast and project your voice and it, it comes back to you in this huge resonant feel or echo. And um, that's why the chants, when you hear a chant in a, in a, in a, a Gregorian chant or in the chanting that was done in Europe, it has a kinship with the ancients, you know, oh, no! you make these sounds and you hear a room fill up with a space. And it's just, it's just part of the, it's part of the evolution of that. So um, I've, I've always, you know, and, and uh, Joseph, I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan who wrote extensively about um, archetypes, mythologies, world mythologies all over the planet. And the, and the, some of the common themes of different mythologies from different places. And you see that there's a lot of commonalities. And, and uh, so, um, and when I lived in the desert, I think the biggest influence on my life was having this intimate relationship with the landscape. And in oral tradition, all the stories have a reference to what's going on right now. Is there wind on my neck? Do I, do I sense moisture in the air? Is there rain clouds coming in? Do I want to try to bring the rain do I, you know, what am I trying to learn about the local environment? And all those stories are imbued with that um, because we had this reverence, all of us, all people from all the planet about our place here, the mystery that is here and, and, and what, you know, the fragility of life. Because if, if you're a hunter and you, you know, you're lucky enough to capture an animal and you watch this animal die before you, either by your own means or, um, whatever, um, when that heart stops, that body grows cold pretty fast. And that experience is transformational in the mystery of life and death. And in the instruments that were made from that animal, the, the guts that might have been used to make the strings, uh, the skin that might have been used to make a drum or stretched over a gourd for a stringed instrument, um, it was very closely tied with the animal population. And those early rituals were all about um, giving thanks back to the local environment and the species that sustained human life. Um, so those commonalities are, are common with all of my native friends um, in, the, in the Southwest and who have um, migrated here. You know, if you look at the migrations that brought the Navajo, the Ne people or, or any, any of them, the, the, the globe is this shifting migratorial pattern of human of human beings, but we have our common ground in, in really our connections with the earth that gives us life. So those are, that's something I've always had a strong feeling about. All right. And this one should not be a shock to anyone. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully at least everyone got at least one, right. Without a doubt that the two well-known historians that share the same first name are myself and Marshall Tremble. But we have, there's at least one distinction, if not many. So I know Marshall has played at your old town center for the arts up in Cottonwood, that amazing building. And I know yeah. I'm going to be up there next month. January 29th. Yeah. Note and, and make a trip up to Cottonwood. Uh, old town center for the arts uh, is something that I'm involved with. My wife, Christy, found this old building, said, we've got to get this and uh, this was in 2003 or no, 2005. And I said, yeah, why not? Let's do it. It was old. It was, uh, in, uh, it was, a uh, inhabited at that time by, um, an antique shop, but it'd been, it was built originally in the thirties, uh, as a church of Latter-day Saints. And, uh, it's been home to, I think six or seven other denominations in its history. It's been home to a bike shop, the department of motor vehicles, an antique store, a music store, all kinds of things. And when Christy found this, Christy uh, danced with Nikolai Dance Theater for many years. And uh, out of New York City, they traveled the world. She's a world traveler in her era, one of the great dancers of her time. She wanted to do aerial work because 
you know, gravity doesn't affect you. You're on silks or trapezes or hoops. And, and she, she took uh, our daughter up to, to Colorado and they, they attended uh, some aerial classes and said, okay, I found the building. It's tall enough. We can do, we can do aerial work in it. And, we got it and renovated the building, and now it's, we've, uh, what, 14, 15 years later, we've done close to 650 shows in there. Um, of, of We bring in talent from all over the world. Um, and Christy's done some dancing in there. My daughter will be performing with um, our Solstice Ensemble this year is uh, Carrie Caruso and Melanie Yarger from Urban Electra. For anybody in the town, they've uh, become a very well-known uh, modern quartet, electric quartet, exciting group. Um, Fitzhugh Jenkins, uh, a world uh, guitar player who's been all over the world. Uh, Claudia Tulip has played in my ensemble for many years. And Bart Applewhite, my apprentice who plays bass. And then my daughter is going to do silks. Um, and you're coming up the 29th. What we're envisioning is uh, for you to, with your w wonderful take on historical things and kind of inform some of our locals about what's you know, some of the interesting things in Cottonwood in the state of Arizona. Um, so that'll be exciting. Um, yeah, no, looking but, forward to that. I, I love I, coming to Cottonwood. Such I think you're going to theater. The, the theater feels historic. Most people come in there and just think, oh, this is, how long has the theater been here? And, and um, when, when Christy, her interior sensibility designs is very, um, it has a period to it. It feels like an old theater. Very elegant, you know, rich colors, lots of maroons and golds. It's it's a it's 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 a it's kind of a cool place. It is indeed. I mean, even just driving around town, that building sticks out. It does. I in the seventies, I distinctly remember um, going through Cottonwood, seeing that building, driving up, getting out of my car, and looking through the window. It was closed. It was a music store at the time, and I distinctly remember looking in the building and saying, "Oh, this would be a cool place to play." <laughs> no idea. You know, I had no idea that I would be the steward of that building one day. You know, it's uh, pe people ask us, you know, that are you do you own this building? I say, yeah, you can't really say that when you when you see a building that's been this many things, all you are is a temporary steward of the place, you know, and it'll it'll get passed on somewhere along the line. So it's but we've we've really enjoyed um, oldtowncenter.org is the place to go to see what's coming up. But we have a Zen Prov comedy this week. Saturday, and then and then uh, I will be hosting the winter solstice. Uh, probably Nakai and Clipman and I will do a concert there in the spring. But we have Muriel Anderson coming in, a, a famous guitarist, harp guitarist, who's played with Chet Atkins and um, uh, Chet, uh, all kinds of really famous guitarists. But she's a famous guitar player in her own right. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Dave Stamey, a real popular, really interesting uh, country singer, a uh, humorist. Uh, but we have, as you mentioned, we've had Marshall Trimble. That's, I, I came up with that question. I thought, you know, is, do you have to have the first name Marshall to be a historian? I know, it was so funny when you sent me the list and I got to that question. I started laughing because I didn't expect to be in, in your quiz. So, <laughs> Well, and I put that in there because when we had the first conversation, I don't, I can't remember if you're aware of Old Town Center for the Arts. So when I said, well, that's become a part of my life you know um, the guitar making school is primary that's always my first priority of of things to do and and the recording and performing career is really important to me um and i, I i'm doing well, a couple gigs a week it's you know pre-covid a lot more and it's, it's starting to come back a little bit which i'm grateful for mm -hmm. um but, and and it was great to get in the recording studio because during covid we didn't record anything so uh, it's it's nice to kind of get back to that. And uh, last night I had a real interesting experience. I, I rediscovered a chamber piece I wrote in 1986, I think it was. I mean, I've written some chamber orchestra pieces for Nouveau, Nouveau West Chamber Orchestra in the Valley and Nebraska Chamber Orchestra. And some, you know, I, mo I know most of those pieces. I can play them on the guitar. That's how I compose them. But there's a song called Wintertime Green. And one of my friends said, just out of the blue said, have you played Wintertime Green lately? And I said, what? I couldn't remember the song. So I'm searching through these old boxes last night and I found the original score to it. 
I brought him here and, and uh, Bart scanned him for me. I'm going to send him to the players and say, you know, here's another piece. And I can't remember what it sounds like because I, I write, I wrote the pieces, but I had to study in order to do that, you know, to make uh, the different parts and the if different clefts. And it was kind of a laborious process, but in the process, I didn't learn to sight read. So I have to, I painstakingly have to think, okay, what do I want it to sound like and notes? And I have to, figure that out. But I found a cassette tape of new OS rec and I, rec fortunately I recorded it. So when I get home tonight, I don't have a cassette player here at the school, but I'm going to get a chance to hear what it sounds like. And I have no idea what it's going to be. Ah, oh, that'll be such a joyous moment getting to hear that bit of your past. Yeah. I mean, at this stage in the game, like I have uh, this company put out my first LP about six months ago. And then they reissued another 500. I thought, who's going to who's going to want that? Uh, and it's a drop in the bucket, you know, a thousand copies. But my original print was only a thousand copies because I thought, you know, the music, you know, most of your viewers have no idea who I am. And and yet I've sold over a million um, units, you know, and and. It's not a lot in the big scheme of things, but it's more than I would have ever imagined, you know, but that's, you know, I've got what, 25 albums out there here and there. And if people are interested, they can just get on Spotify or I use or, you know, iTunes or any of the music services and just, you know, play Alexa, play William Eaton ensemble and they'll hear some music and they can sort through it if they're, if they have an interest in what, what the music that I do sounds like or the stuff with Nakai um, and some of the other ensembles. But that's amazing thing to me, Marshall. I've got, I can find almost every song I've ever done on those services and I don't have them. I got to listen to albums like Wisdom Tree that came out in the early nineties <clears throat> and Edgar Meyer's on that. Edgar Meyer won the, he won a, one of those genius awards. They, get, they hand you $500,000. Oh yeah. They're called the genius awards. Uh, and, because he's that good. He's, he's brilliant. I feel so fortunate. I got to meet him and he plays on my album. And uh, I hadn't heard that for years. And I just a few, like a couple months ago, I said, play wisdom tree. And sure enough, the album shows up and I thought, wow, I haven't heard that music for 20 or 30 years. And um, it brought back a memory with, with Edgar. I wrote one of the pieces kind of classical pieces called fruiting tree. And we did 31 takes, you know, people that are watching that, that Beatles get back, you know, all the takes that those guys do. I was amazed how much work they put into it. Now the 31 takes that Edgar and I did, I think we only went through the whole song maybe eight times. So I caught, you know, but, but we, we started because take 31 and it's because he's such a perfectionist. He wanted to get his parts just right. <clears throat> it was kind of frustrating to me because I thought, you know, I know the piece, it's my piece, but if I make a mistake and he has a good one, then, then we're screwed. <laughs> How does that work? So I had to try to do every, but so after we finished that process and I'd forgotten about this, um, I said, okay, for the next song, let's just do an improv. And uh, it's called Holding On to the Wild. The reason I named it that is because in this piece, it's like, it's uh, it kind of has this organic start, but then it has this point where he does stuff on on a double bass that nobody does. Sounds like a whale or and then he goes way up high and makes these sounds and uh, it sounds like wild animals or something. You know what is it? What sounds are those? And this is all on a double bass, um, and. Uh, the piece is a beautiful piece. It has this, it has sections of it that are just really wild and organic and moving and, and angular. And then it comes to this real soft melody. That's just a beautiful melody. And he hits this melody that, that he's never heard before. I've never heard before. And it just comes out in one take. We just did one wow. take. Wow. Not 31. Yeah. Not 31. That was done. I think by now your viewers are saying, gosh, this is getting pretty boring. I'm tired of hearing. This is not boring at all. I mean, you, I mean, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, I've talked to folks at Canyon. They've never explained how kind of Canyon got started. I mean, their story is it's always, oh, we have showed at the state fair and that's where it started. 
So I love hearing you go back and tell that story because it's a little bit more information well, than even they've been sharing. Well, and Mary Bowley, Ray's wife, was integral in that start. And, you know, you imagine them going around in a motorhome to sell sell their wares. I, to me, that's an interesting part of the story. Oh, my gosh. That would have been fascinating to travel around the state that early yeah. and to find these little pockets where tourists were going. I didn't realize that's where they had started kind of. I always wondered how they found their niche. That's their niche because um, and that extended to the southwest and then eventually extended throughout the United States where they would find these little stores, gift shops. Um, some of them were record stores, but they really got they really got um, a real foundation in these places where people coming, you know, the Southwest, because, you know, the first time was in the 60s. I moved here in 69 to the Phoenix area and um, it was a different place. You know, and if you traveled through the northern part of the state, if you came from Colorado and you come down through Monument Valley and Cayenta and um, or up through, through Moab and down and over to Tuba City and, and down to, to a Flagstaff, it was very remote. You know, you're hoping you could you didn't run out of gas because, you know, where are you going to find gas until you get to Flagstaff or, or wherever? So when they go out in these remote places to establish these little shops, you know, people that are interested in films and watch some of those old Westerns that were done in Monument Valley, you know, you those are some of those same eras. Some of those were done 50s and 60s where it played, things were quite different than they are now. Um, and uh, so to me, uh, Ray Bowley and, and Mary, his wife, <clears throat> it was kind of a, a duo thing. And I think it's they just they love the desert and they they loved Ed Lee Nate and then wanted to bring the culture to others. And what a gift, because. Their early recordings and all the way through what Robert Doyle has done. And Robert worked with uh, Ray Bowley early on um, and uh, and then eventually took over Canyon Records. And he's retired, but he's he's basically come out of retirement to produce our album, which we're really grateful for. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> but but it's, you know, what a gift to record um, a culture. You know, because there, 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 there's lots of powwow groups, chicken scratch groups, um, singers, drummers, flutists, a lot of great flutists. Uh, Tony Duncan's playing some beautiful things, and his good friend Darren that accompanies him on guitar. Um, it, there's uh, some really wonderful, the peyote singers. Um, that uh, it's quite a catalog. Lots of lots of stuff and. They weathered the, the storm when, you know, the, they continued to keep the label live when so many, you know, the Internet just ate everything up. Uh, there was um, a lot of pirating and a lot of the companies in the record industry just uh, went out of business. They couldn't survive. And I think one of the reasons Canyon survived is because they had the they had such a network of all these shops that continue to carry their stuff and still do. Uh, OK. Um, and Robert has made, I think, what I would say is a good transition in, in the digital world and online. But uh, it was hard to predict that during the time it was happening. And uh, a lot of people just got caught uh, without without distribution, without sales. And of course, now it's entirely different. You know, when, when uh, if I pull up my cell phone and, and say, play this and I hear it, you know, that, that's even CDs are kind of outdated. You know, CD. I was they, you and I know what those are, but there's so many folks who have never held a CD. Everything yeah. they have is on their phone or is in some SoundCloud somewhere. Yeah. And uh, it will get it will get more minimal as we go. I mean, it's 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 just it's really according to storage devices. And then um, we do have to translate it into, a you know, at least earbuds or some way to hear it. Um but maybe there's something, you know, there's maybe there's something, uh, another delivery. I, it's not something I've imagined, but uh, it's uh, it's 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 and I'm I'm going through some archival stuff now because <clears throat> during the pandemic, I decided, OK, I got these old tapes, reel to reel tapes and my my deck doesn't work anymore. And luckily, um I found um, a good friend who over the years has been a tech um, still doing it 
and was able, he was able to fix my four track TAC deck. It's, um, it's kind of a famous machine that I bought in the early 70s. Um, I don't, somebody told me the Beatles recorded Sgt. Pepper's, but that's not true. So they, they recorded on um, a four track, but it wasn't, to my knowledge, it wasn't a TAC, but it was of the same vintage. And it's been fun to go through those old recordings. And the same company that's putting out my LP wants to put out my second recording. It was on a, a cassette. They want to put that out as an LP. So I've found all but one song on, and um, the thing about those old tapes is some of them are degraded. So far, so good. The ones that I've really counted, and they, they do what's called baking the tapes now. So if you can't get the material, you start it, and you can't get it. Because what's happening is it's basically shredding as it, go, it goes past right. the reading. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And when you bake it, um, physically heat it up, some you sometimes if you're lucky you can get one more play through it, and uh, that one play okay. is your last attempt to recover in that thing. So far, so good on the cassettes. I've been able to listen to those, and and uh, those for some reason have seemed to hold up better. But the the the, the reel to reels were from the '70s, so right. Um, I mean, I've heard, I've heard stories about people playing the reel to reel, and basically as it goes across the playhead, you just start seeing the dust falling yeah. off. And yeah. that's the one time that you get to play it. And after I play it, I have to swab it with the alcohol to clean off the residue. And you can physically see it. It's as it's going across that tape head, it's degrading. And it's right. either degrading into dust or it degrades into kind of a, it's almost like if it's heated all, all of a sudden, it's just kind of melting onto the head. It's, uh, and who would have thought of that, you know? And I think of all the material uh, but, you know, like the big studios with the films and stuff, you know, think about trying to recapture those. And But yeah, things that really counted, I think they were on that probably pretty early. But if you're like me and some sitting sit in a storage for decades and then you say, I think I'll get that out. But, oh, my deck doesn't work. My cassette deck didn't work either. Um, so it, it, uh, it got repaired as well. So... All right, so we have one. So we have one, one last question, which I know you've alluded to. But where do graduates of Roberto Venn start working? Um, all of the above, and I yeah, what I sent you is some logos because if you think of a guitar company, um, chances are we've had somebody work for them or they're working for them right now. Um, next week, for example, we have Summer Welsh coming out from Gibson Guitars. I think from two class ago, they hired about six graduates in the next class. I hired two or three, and now they're interested more. Gibson is going through a major change, or they have. They've got a new ownership, and JC, that's the CEO, is really, really doing a great job. We're really excited about Gibson making a huge comeback, I would call it a comeback. And they want to hire about 100 people in the next six months to a year, which is, wow. in the guitar world, is a lot. It does, maybe that... Some industries that wouldn't be a lot, but you know, it, it's it's uh, to find somebody experienced to go to work for them. So we're doing our best to get them some some talent. Um, and on those on those pictures that show all those logos, you know, you see Fender. Um, one of their best custom builders is one of our guys, Paul Waller. Their senior research design engineer Ryan Zaletsky is is from our school, um, and we have other people in the engineering department and other in the building and repair world in Fender. Taylor guitars. People might be familiar with Bob Taylor. I met Bob Taylor when he was in his garage, 1976. Um, one of his first employees was Will Harris, one of our early grads. And he is now, I think Taylor is probably, I want to say third or fourth largest company in the world in guitar making. <clears throat> he just started out in a garage and uh, they've hired over the years, lots of graduates from us. Uh, Eric Bosprink, I just got a note from him. He's hiring somebody. He's in Hawaii now, but uh, he was the chief purchasing officer for uh, for Taylor for many years. So you, you just go company by company, um, and we have stories to tell, you know, about graduates. Um, the other pictures I sent, like um, the one in the lower left hand, is Reverend Guitars. Um, Joe Naylor started that out after a few years out of the school. Reverend is a very large company. They make lots of guitars, and they've made a lot for 
really well-known artists. Scott Walker guitars are amazing. He's got a company going. Um, so we, and uh, Baldacci guitars, a recent grad. So that's another, um, that's another list of our, what our graduates do. They start their own companies. Um, we have uh, lots of guys that go into repair work. Um, we have people like Steve Olson from Elderly. He's their top guy. Uh, my brother, John, went into repair. He's, I talked to him a couple weeks ago. They have 900 guitars, um, 300 of them in the shop, 600 on call of people that want their guitars repaired. Phenomenal. You know, pandemic, wow. everybody got guitars out of the closet or buying them online and wants it want to do something at home, you know, that's tired of watching all the, the Netflix. I want to do something, you know, creative. And so right. guitar sales have really gone up. Uh, we, in our history, 46 years now, we have more, more job offers for our graduates than any time in our history. So anybody out there that's looking for a, a, a career, this is a good time to get into guitar making or repair because you, you've got Collings guitars, uh, probably one of the, definitely one of the best, um, uh, uh, guitars on the market um, and they do a lot of hand building processes. Um, Steve Null is now their foreman in the shop. He's kind of taken over the role that Bill Collins, the founder did. And we're so proud of him. He sent me a photo of, I think 24 of our grads. I think half of their works, half of their workforce is from our school. Ha, and, uh, nice. He's on, our, he's on our advisory committee and came in what, two weeks ago and, and he just sent me a photo. He says, yeah, I got all the guys in the shop from Roberto Van. Lots of them have their Roberto Van t-shirts on. And he sent me a photo. That was really cool to see that. Um, but it's it's really gratifying to see, you know, graduates in all these. Well, one of the vice presidents of Gibson was uh, uh, Mike Volz. He just retired. He was vice president of Gibson. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, as I'm looking at, it's Michi Matsuda. Now, that's another category. Michi um, and next to him is Ray Kraut. Below him is, with the reddish guitar with the sunburst is Mario Beauregard. To his left, uh, the gentleman looking, staring at the fretboard there, he's doing some work. That's Michael Bernick. And then uh, the gentleman down below that is, actually has a left-handed guitar, that's Jason Costell. Those five are some of the best guitar makers in the world right now. They all come from our school. Oh. They're selling guitars anywhere from twenty to sixty thousand dollars for one guitar. Uh, so they are serious artists, and we have others in that category. I didn't put all the pictures up there, obviously, but right. Uh, and then another category are the repair techs. So uh, um, <coughs> the picture with a trio in it to the left is is Steve Olson. I mentioned him. Elderly is uh, a, a famous re uh, music store repair facility, and he's their head guy from our school, John Eaton, my brother at Woodsongs, Luthery, and Frank Ford. Those three are probably, I would put them in the top, you know, in anybody's top five or 10 repair techs in the world. Um, and my brother in the right-hand corner there in the, in the black and white photo, he's what I'm saying, 900 guitars. And he has uh, seven employees, all of them from the school except one. And uh, so he's got quite a Roberto Venn contingency and they're working on guitars. But Guitar Center, people are aware of that. That's the biggest chain, well, Sam Ash and Guitar Center. I talked to their, um, the head of their repair division just today. They, they are interested in having us help them with a project of fixing their in-house guitars. These are guitars that Guitar Center owns, but somebody dropped one, uh, oh. some, some problem, and they're having difficulty with keeping up. He's telling me they have about 150,000 of these guitars each year that they have to deal with. And wow, uh, my, my solution and uh, not that they're listening right now. I said, set me up with a CEO. I want to talk with top management because that was, that was what I was doing in business school is, you know, studying all these um, case studies. And I, when I see a company like guitar center, it's an interesting dynamic because their management team comes from other, uh, other fields, other industries, and they're really sharp with their business minds, but they don't come up through guitar making. And what I've been trying to convince them is how important the repair and service world is to their company because they don't give it much attention, you know, and I'll, I'll tell this to the CEO straight to their straight to him or her is that, um, to, you know, the, the key thing is with a guitar company that's making guitars is um, to make a, a wonderful product that plays well. 
has to sound great and play easy. And it won't play easy if it, if it needs setup work, if the action is too high, so it's hard to press the strings down, if there's buzzing, if the neck is completely straight with no relief in it. There's, there's lots of little functionality parts of a guitar that have to be attended to. And Guitar Center, I just don't think has paid close enough attention to that. And uh, so I'm hoping to have talks with their, I said this time, I'd like an audience with their upper management because I've talked to their repair tech directors for years and they're all on board. They know the same things I do, but they, they're not getting the, they're not in get, getting the years of that because it's only 20% of their revenue source. So they, they don't, they don't give it the importance that it is. And, uh, you know, my brother and I and cousin own a music store. So I, I really learned the foundation of a good music store is developing community. You know, you're, you're providing a service to the artists in the community that are, that in, in a flourishing community, you know, you go to the local pub or the bar or the cafe and you hear wonderful local music. And it starts with, and guitar is a big part of that. A lot of, it's the most popular instrument. So you want to, you want to be able to have really instruments that really count for the people playing them. And uh, so that's, that's a project that we're interested in. We've, we've placed a lot of people at the guitar center, but uh, they, uh, they are, uh, I think if they put more emphasis on that and the, the solution to their problem with these in-house guitars is really improve the, the chops and the skill set of their, of their current workforce and add to that so they can handle those repairs. And that's what we talked about right. today. And I said, if you can, if you can help make that work, we're, we're a band aid. We can help you fix some of those guitars, but we're not, we're not, we're going to, we're not going to take on 150,000 guitars a year. Right. That's not going to happen in our shop. But you're right. I mean, last night I went to an open mic and it was a mix of poetry and at least three, if not four guitar players. Yeah. And some of them had been like, you know, I started doing this during the pandemic or yeah. I hadn't the, or the flip side is one guy who was busy from LA was like, I haven't played for the last year and a half because of COVID not being able to get the group together again. So he's like, I've just, I've just been doing solo work. Yeah. So when I, when we got, when we, we had our, the second concert at Old Town Center for the Arts, I had the electric harp guitar group, my good friends, Anthony Mazzella and Fitz, Fitzhugh Jenkins, really two fantastic guitarists. I feel really honored and lucky to play with them. And we were going over the repertoire these, and I said, asked Fitz, what, 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 what do you want to play? He says, well, I didn't get, I didn't get to play my guitar much over the pandemic. How about my guitar gently weeps? Oh, <laughs> He was saying, uh, yeah, I'm not the only one that's sad. My guitar didn't get much attention, so my guitar has been weeping. So we did We did that. It was kind of fun. Audience got a kick out of that one. Nice. Well, William, we always end. I always ask people how they did, but also be sure and let them know that it's not how many you got right or wrong, but look at all the amazing stories. And William, thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much just not about the school but kind of about your own background connection to the planet and so much more so thank you so much my pleasure to be on the show thank you yeah and we will definitely be talking about what's going on up in cottonwood on the 29th of january that's going to be a really fun night yeah yeah it's it's uh you know, people that want to do a day trip, it's about an hour and a half from here, hour, 40 minutes. And you're just going to, you're going to drive up there Saturday and you're going to see old town Cottonwood that has been revived. It's kind of a boom bust town. You know, it was, it was big way back um, in the era of mining when the Jerome thing was really booming. Jerome is the same thing. Jerome becomes a ghost town. Now it's an arts place. Old Town is following suit, you know, and when we bought the, the building there to make Old Town Center of the Arts, the Old Town area was probably about half occupied. It was, you know, just every other place was for rent. Now wineries, wine growers have moved in and yeah. local uh, grape growing is happening in a big way and restaurants and arts places. So Old Town is a fun place to visit and we're just we're just a few blocks from the main street. We're on the main street. It's just where you, it curves around into the 
the area. So it's it's a fun day trip. Come up and uh, have a nice dinner. Come come see Marshall, and uh, uh, we're gonna we're hoping to have John Conway to talk about the history of films. Patrick Schweiss, the director of Sedona International Film Festival, who operates a, a wonderful festival every year and year round. He's programming at the Mary yeah. Fish Theater in Sedona, and they're adding another theater right next to the Mary D. Fisher. So it's awesome. Oh, I didn't um, realize that. And Patrick is a force to be recognized with. He's he's just so charismatic, and he's done such a great job in his programming. And we're showing movies now at Old Town Center for the Arts in partnership with Sedona International Film Festival. Mondays, uh, Monday movies on Maine. And uh, so come up on a Monday night and see a film. We have Deconstructing the Beatles uh, next week. Interesting series. So lots of great things happening up there. Indeed. So, William, th again, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And I look forward to chatting with you some more about what's coming up next month. Great. We'll be in All touch. Right. Take care of yourself. You Thanks, everybody, care. for those tuned in. We really appreciate your, your attention. Have a great night, William. You too. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Was not expecting so many amazing stories, kind of a little bit of everything. And I have to say, I'm honestly really thrilled to hear kind of the beginning of Canyon because, I mean, they had so much influence from music to film. Ah, oh, so, ah, oh, thank you, William, so much. That was really wonderful. So getting ready to close out the show, we always end with From the Vault. And so tonight we are going to talk about um, something that you'll, you can find up at the MIM, the Musical Instrument Museum. I thought, you know, how appropriate to talk about more music-related things. And so... If you go, you'll wind up in a little exhibit called the Electronic Music Section and display. And there's a one fascinating little keyboard that kind of, let's. So, yeah, so this white keyboard right there was actually built and designed right here in Phoenix. And it's kind of an interesting story. So you've got this guy. Rick Copeland, and he was actually working for a Ramada Inn. Him and another gentleman, they were bringing in um, technology, getting Ramada Inn set up on the computer. Now, while they were doing that, they also started developing some sound, electronic sound things. And so he eventually wound up working with Ramada Inn. And even though they had done the work for them, they kept paying him and he was building that amazing keyboard just as it was getting ready to launch a uh, Ramada N basically pulled all the money. So that's why you see it in such a finished form and there's only one or two around. And I love that one of them is sitting at the mem. Um, I've talked to some folks who've actually played it years ago back at ASU and so that's going to be a lot of fun. So next week, our guest for happy hour is Dylan Proby. Now, what I love about this is it's actually kind of tying into Festivus, which is coming up next weekend, actually next week, um, Wednesday and Thursday. And so Dylan has designed a T-shirt that I'm so excited. We're actually, I'm, I think I'm picking them up on Monday from the Silk Screener. Oh my gosh, we are sharing some amazing Arizona history on a shirt that probably no one knows. And I'm really excited because the goal is we're going to have a QR code on the very back of the shirt. And so we're going to talk about Dylan and his family history, as well as a little bit about Charles Harrison, which nobody knows who he is, but hopefully we can start to change that a little bit. So remember, if you have any questions, suggestions, you can either throw them in the chat or you can please throw them off into various internet sources to get to me. I always li love giving a shout out to PJ. Excited to be having your cocktail, not just tonight, but also on Saturday out at Majestic Theater, as well as Chris and Cole, who made that amazing intro video for me. And as we get ready to say goodnight, 
I'm excited because a couple weeks ago, we actually shot promos for Festivus. So tonight we're going to show Mayor Kate Gallego talking a little about Festivus and why you should be buying local. I mean, Festivus is going to have, I think they're up to over 170 vendors. It's not going to just be in the public market like in the past. I mean, for its 12th year, it's really kind of blowing it out. Um, returning back to a physical shopping experience. They're going to have First Street. There's going to be shops along there. That's where I'm going to be, along with Dylan, who's going to have some of his artwork and some of his clothing there as well. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you as we can out at Festivus. They're using all that extra space so that people can socially distance if need be. And it used to get really packed. And so they're just trying to expand it and make it bigger and better and more exciting. So without any further ado, let's have a few words from Kate Gallego. I'm Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego, excited to celebrate the 12th annual Festivus Market. It's an amazing chance to shop local. When you shop local, the money stays in our community, supporting our kids, our public infrastructure, and so much more. You'll also get to meet the people whose businesses you are supporting, as well as amazing local musicians and artists. And perhaps most importantly, Freddie's back. <laughs> so please join us December 15th and 16th from 5 to 10 p.m. Thank you. Join us. Join us. <laughs> oh, no, you're right, <laughs> 